I'd like to ask the panel to briefly introduce yourselves and also to answer the trick question, what is Web 2? Hi, everybody. I'm Nisa Amoyles, uh, managing partner at A100X Ventures, uh, early stage venture capital fund investing in all sectors uh, that touch blockchain and AI. Uh, previously, a securities lawyer and um, a bunch of other things in the space. Um, so Web2 to me is uh, something that I was investing in in the early 2000s. Um, but uh, controlled by uh, FANG, for lack of a better acronym, uh, but, but really um, emerged as the uh, internet was being born and, um, you know, uh, allowed these um, companies to amass huge amounts of power over us and um, allowed us to be the um, objects since we weren't paying for uh, usage of these companies. So I think uh, Web3, for lack of a better term, is, is going to shift that uh, away from uh, these oligarchs. Uh, uh, oligopolies, sorry, not oligarchs. <laughs> Thank you. We'll come back to some of the points. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Brad Staples. I'm the CEO of APCO Worldwide. We're a global consulting group working with a host of different clients uh, driving uh, uh, Web Web3. Uh, in health, in transportation, in energy, uh, financial services, of course, cryptocurrencies. So we get to wrestle with the uh, external challenges that uh, those businesses are dealing with as they emerge and um, look to establish themselves. I think Web2 is in trouble, um, facing some headwinds, facing some complexity, and increasingly indistinguishable from other large multinationals in other sectors. Thank you. And I'm uh, Brigitte Vizna. I'm um, Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons. Uh, Creative Commons is a global nonprofit that really supports better sharing of knowledge and culture uh, all over the world. We're known for our licenses. Um, and I'm sure all of you have been on Wikipedia at least once. If you scroll down to the bottom of every uh, single page of Wikipedia, you will see our licenses mentioned there. We are what makes content freely accessible, uh, free of most copyright restrictions. Um, and I'd say that Web 2 is kind of the wrong turn that the web took after Web 1. Um, web 1 was based on openness, was based on interoperability, uh, it fostered collaboration, and Web 2 kind of got rid of all those good things about the original web. Um, it uh, created walled gardens, gatekeepers, where knowledge cannot be shared, people cannot collaborate, everything is closed and restricted. And one big culprit is copyright law. So I'm a copyright lawyer by background. And at Creative Commons, we really work towards policy to reform copyright, to tear down the, ba the barriers so that people can share uh, knowledge and culture uh, in the public interest. And hi, everybody. I'm Morgan McKenney. I'm CEO of Provenance Blockchain Foundation. Provenance Blockchain is a open public layer one in Cosmos ecosystem focused on supporting regulated and in, um, institutional finance. And for me, it's it's read, write, own, right? So web is read, web one, web two is a write, publish, and then web three is own. And because now we can finally transfer value digitally in ways that aren't digital copies, right? So when you blast photos uh, of your friends, tell your uh, family, um, you know, you're sending digital copies and the internet needs a way or the digital world needs a way to actually transfer value, money, financial assets, et cetera. And that's what blockchain enables you to do. Thank you so much. I, obviously, the, the topic is you know bridging Web two and Web three. So I just wondered uh, if we could sort of start with Web two uh, because that's not something that comes up often. In fact, some people say that Web three is just a marketing term. What would you guys say to that? I'll just kick it off. I do think while it is this amorphous blob and it kind of encompasses so many different things, I do think that allows a lot of people to participate. I went to NFT NYC uh, in June of last year, I guess, and it was, um, you know, the world has woken up to NFTs and financial services was 2.5% of speakers, right? The, the relevance of Web3 across 
various industries is large when you think about NFTs way to help you engage with your customers as an example. In financial services, Web3 means moving things of value. So I think while it's a, a very amorphous term, it does help bring in a lot of investment, talent, etc. I completely agree with that. And I think it was a better term than NFT. Um, like if you look at what Ron did uh, recently, um, they called it digital collectibles instead of NFTs and, and got like mass adoption um, more than NFTs had. And I think there was something to be said in marketing terms, whether or not Web3 is the right term. It was created, it's brought in institutions beyond you know, financial institutions that we all felt were coming, that now you have the big brands that are participating like Starbucks and, and some of the luxury goods brands, et cetera. Um, and I think that the audience is, is just so much bigger now than it was when we were just talking about terms like crypto. Um, and people feel like they can really participate in this now. Um, so it, I think that's exciting. I, I think it's extraordinary you ask the question. I think asking the question illustrates that it's not established, it's not commonly used, and it's not a notion that the population at large has really bought into yet. We're still in this hybrid place of wrestling with cryptocurrency, NFT, and other notions that the public at large hasn't really become accustomed to. It suggests the potential that this technology is going to empower the individual improve the environment, add something to the economy, make a contribution to society, all sorts of things. It's locked in there somewhere, but it's just not part of the common narrative yet. And it's a conversation at Davos. There has to be a lot more than a conversation at Davos. Yeah, at Creative Commons, we're looking at um, what the next step might be after Web 2, but it might not be necessarily um, Web 3. We think of it as a better internet one that really centers on openness, collaboration, interoperability, the foundations of Web1 that I mentioned at the beginning. And Creative Commons was really built on um, a decentralized model. And this is something that is very core to the way that we see how collaboration and exchanging uh, knowledge uh, should be. So more open, having greater usability, greater discoverability of content. A lot of content now is on the web, but impossible to find. It's being preserved on pages that are end up in 404 uh, errors. Link rot is a huge issue. Um, and so that's why working towards a better internet that will solve these challenges is what we work towards. So why aren't people banging on tables and demanding web free and you know demanding to own their digital entities and their, you know, why are they quite happy with the current status quo? Maybe just one comment, and actually I was chatting with the CEO of Ledger, Pascal, um, recently, and he feels that it's, we're so used to ticking the box, agree, 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 right? You don't, you never read the terms and conditions. If you move to ownership, meaning you own your identity, you own your assets, you not, and you control them, right? It's a self-checkout lane of finance. You can do things with your own assets. You don't have to ask anybody else to do something with them. That relies on a lot more responsibility. If I own my own assets and you know I lose my my private keys, if you know if I haven't been using a custodial provider, those assets are gone. So it raises the bar of consumer responsibility, which not every consumer perhaps is uh, ready for. So it changes behavior. It gives you, uh, it empowers you, but it also raises the bar of responsibility. And and should that be? Do you feel? Do you, and I, I'm asking the panel. Do you feel that? Um, web free is something that is demand led. I think there's a hunger to do something about web two. There's clearly. Oh, a, I mean, Facebook, look at my mother. Right, right, She's right. on it all day. No, no, no. But, but in terms of the public's perception about these organizations have become too big, this notion of gatekeeper, gatekeeper is slipping from policy elites to the public at large. There's a sense that the CEOs of these organizations are far too wealthy relative to the value that they've created. They're far too interested in valuation rather than value. Uh, and I think there's a hunger for a change. There's a hunger for privacy, security, and the ability to take control of one's own data. That's definitely there. I mean, the, the mass, why isn't the mass market demanding this? Your, that's your question. And I think it's just a matter of education. They don't really know uh, what is possible yet because so much has been just of the media has just been focused on crypto. 
Um, oh, it's and, the media. Um, <laughs> no, sorry. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think once we start changing the narrative and, and focusing on the benefits, um, they will want it. And they won't even know what they're using when they get what they want, right? That's the end goal. It's like we don't talk about HTTP or FTP right now. Uh, and we didn't because there was no Twitter back then like the monitoring every th single thing that was happening and who was going to win, right? It, we just were aware of, oh, we can shop online, we can talk to each other, right? So that, that's what's going to happen here eventually. And can you guys uh, just um, tell me what the convenience is for consumers? Because, you know, we touched on responsibility, we touched on difficulties and hurdles. What, it, you know, how am I kind of better off in terms of my lazy personality. What is my convenience? Let me ask you, Eva, in a, in a store, do you go through the self-checkout line even if there's no line at the register? No. You don't? No, I mean, why would I? I mean, because it's more convenient. <laughs> you control it. You. It's you know, not as I pay the same. Huh? I have to actually lift it up and scan it, and then it goes unexpected item in the bagging area, and then I stand there for ages. Okay, well, maybe you're not an early adopter. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not. But, uh, but some of you guys go through the shelf even if there's no line. It's just like, I'll do it myself, kind of. It's DIY. There's a lot of DIY That's why you action. have to convince me. You know, I'm still at the back of the queue. <laughs> So I think there is a convenience needs to be improved. The UI UX of DeFi, for example, is terrible, right? And you, you'd asked in another session, does you, DeFi have a UI UX problem? Yes, everything falls on the floor. So it's not, I'm a digital done right delights girl, but the done right really has to be very good, right? Or you have that you know, annoying friction when you're trying to do it yourself. But if you have an amazing wow, there is something. And digital, you know, analog doesn't scale. So you know, if there's a lot of people in the store. So I think, uh, it's not quite as convenient as it should be yet. There, it's still quite immature, but it will become a lot more convenient. And will it be cheaper? Will it be easier? From my point of view, it's going to be massively cheaper. Again, in DeFi land or in put, when you put all of the world of finance goes through intermediated hubs, and that worked before, right? Trusted, et cetera. However, when you have an alternative that you don't have to go through hubs that are taking you know, large pieces of that value, uh, you can really lower the cost. So in decentralized, it really is open innovation. It is crowdsourcing the future. It's crowdsourcing the future finance and all these other industries. So I think that lowers and you can compensate people for participating in the ways that they're contributing. If you think about platforms today, like an Uber, an Uber isn't giving equity to the driver, even though the, the drivers are essential to the proposition. So tokenomics and DeFi lets you reward people who are performing consensus, people who are staking their tokens, people who are you know, writing dApps, et cetera. So it allows for a, more, a greater collaborative schema to help reward participation. Well, what, we, what we're mostly concerned about is that these values that Creative Commons has been um, pushing for for 20 years do make it in the next iteration of the web. So openness, as I mentioned, collaboration, and making sure that emerging technologies are also built on new uh, issues that maybe were not so front and center 20 years ago, like sustainability, um, ethics, um, these new concerns that have emerged because of the failures of Web2, they really need to be addressed in the next iteration. The, the only, I mean, I think this is all great. The, the, the only challenge is that what's leading in the public mind, Web3, is cryptocurrencies. And at the moment, we're seeing a huge loss of value. We're seeing huge job cuts. We're seeing businesses going bankrupt. And so this notion of creating value is being foreshadowed by what's going on with FTX and everything else. We don't have to go into all the details. But it creates an existential threat to building excitement and a real commitment for this new era of, uh, of the web. And and so rebuilding rep reputation and getting engaged in a way that demonstrates to a much broader audience that this is a paradigm change, that, that's still got to happen. I think you mean overshadowed, right? No. Yeah. Probably, yeah, um, overshadowed. Yeah, no, I agree with everything. And financial services, everything um, that was said, uh, obviously, but also there's um, the whole other gaming <sighs> component, right? For a lot of gamers out there, how does this make it better for them? Um, well, they get to own their own assets in the games. They get to eliminate platform risk from being on a certain, you know, controlled environment. Um, I think 
that's one area that's going to really lead the way in showing the benefits in addition to everything that's happening with NFTs. How about a plumber? A plumber? What? How would they, you know, I mean, it's, oh, great, a plumber. it's great to have a gamer uh, example, but how about a plumber? they play games in their spare time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, you know, curious how, you know, what benefit, you know, if it's oh. not gaming, then how would the plumber benefit, for example? Maybe I would jump in there. Yeah. Um, I think blockchain enables it, it fostering of a community of interest, like-minded interests. So that plumber probably watches sports, let's say, and he loves Messi. I'm making it up. <laughs> and he can get an NFT that allows him to engage beyond, you know, going to that game when he with his family, right, in in Europe, kind of thing. So. I think um, blockchain enables people to pursue their passions and find like-minded folks in different spaces. And it allows you to live on the physical experience, let's say, with digital engagement going on forward. So he has passions and interests that might be you know, collecting some kind of NFT with his friends. You mentioned plumber and it triggered a metaphor in my in my head. So it's a, it's a different answer. I don't think it's the one you're expecting, but um, we, we're basically offering the plumbing, the infrastructure for sharing, and that's what needs to be um, updated. <laughs> we have a lot of rusty pipes that need to be updated, and I think that a lot of it has to be uh, undertaken by uh, public services. Uh, we've relied way too much on big corporations that control our data, uh, that provide the, plum the plumbing that we think we absolutely need, and there's a huge gap there for a public service infrastructure that would come and bring this openness, bring this interoperability, bring these values that I mentioned, um, and, and, and really erase those barriers that have prevented uh, people from really collaborating on the web. He has a side hustle. If he has a side hustle, he's creating content and he can get paid for it now. I mean, just it really does create the opportunity to be a mini entrepreneur because people can pay you digitally. See, I know this guy. I know exactly who you're talking about. Um, great. Thank you so much. Now, let's move on to the actual topic of this discussion, which is how are you guys going to replumb this? How are you guys going to do this plumbing? And, you know, what's the kind of, you know, dragon killer, if you like? I, wanted, I didn't want to go a Zuckerberg killer, but, you know, what's the kind of um, uh, application and, and the, the sort of ultimate fix that you need to make? Anyone wants to? I think financial services has to be part of the play because it's uh, it's so legacy um, and all of the financial innovation over the last decade has really been at the consumer app layer, right? Fintechs have come in, have helped create better user experiences on your phone. That hasn't changed the plumbing, the infrastructure layer of finance, which blockchain can do by issuing you know, mortgages, HELOCs, et cetera, natively on chain and then allowing that life cycle of financial services activity to happen a lot more efficiently. Um, and I think we, 2022 was the first year we saw true institutional adoption in core business use cases of large institutions. That's really important. We're past POC land. There's a lot that still needs to be matured around digital identity, digital security, custodian capability, regulatory framework, all of that. But we're not in the first or second inning for anybody who follows baseball. We are, we're more like third or fourth inning kind of thing. So we're well on our way for TradFi to actually operate their business better on blockchain. For us, improvement will come through policy. So um, I'm biased here as director of policy. I think every, policy can fix everything. But um, yeah, empowering citizens to have better control over their data, um, that they decide who, can, who gets access to it and how it can be shared and how it can uh, really truly benefit uh, society as a whole. Um, and also copyright policy needs to be improved. It's a huge barrier. We don't realize, you mentioned the terms of services on these websites, they prevent so much that uh, should be uh, should be able. So we really have a detailed policy agenda to reform copyright, and it's going to take a lot of effort. So um, campaigns are uh, are on the way to really protect the public domain, which is kind of the reverse of what is protected by copyright. To make sure that people can really dive into this pool of content that is free for everyone to access and use and reuse in any kind of way, and that is where creativity emerges. So would it be something like, sorry, just one second. Would it be something, the, the copyright issue is something I wanted to pick up on. Um, how do you envisage um, the kind of opposite of copyright, you know, or the public good information? Would there be a regulator or some centralized body who says this is in the public interest, this isn't? Or 
the public domain is basically what is not protected by copyright. And copyright lasts for a very long time, for the entire life of the author plus 70 years. So you have works that are created today that will that can be protected for, let's say, uh, 200 years in total. That is a very long time for people not to be able to reuse that content. And how would that, what will happen if that content is on an NFT? If I'm, an, I'm the author, I own the, you know, the article, yeah. I own all my data on the it. The interrelationship between NFTs and copyright is very murky at the moment. So uh, lots of debate, uh, extreme positions on both sides. We're navigating this. Um, I can refer you to a blog post that we did recently on uh, Creative Commons, uh, well, CC0, which is our uh, public domain dedication tool, the interplay between CC0 content and NFTs and how these legal questions can be navigated, but a lot of uncertainty still. Thank you. Well, I was just going to pick up on Bridget's point about policy. Actually, policy and regulation is an unanticipated kind of area where there are allies and advocates that could actually, you, you can't build a market through regulation but you can certainly level the playing field a little or create an awareness that, that brings about change. And on questions of privacy, security, the dominance in, of, of certain entities in, in Web2, so long as there's a real deep understanding of the nature of this innovation and what it can mean, there is a welcome audience or there's some receptive ears in Brussels and Washington and other places. Um, I'm not sure that the messages are getting across as fast and as clearly as they need to, and overshadowing it all is, is the whole cryptocurrency issue right now. I, I don't know how much time there is for Web3 to get its voice clearly known and be cohesive and powerful, because the Web2 players learn quickly. They are engaged in multi-stakeholder engagements around the world. They're talking about food insecurity, they're talking about climate change, they're talking about many, many issues. And so their place is vocal and very prominent. But I do think it's an interesting point that, that in places where regulation is defined, there may be some interesting allies. Thank you so much. I, I would just add to that and say in Washington, from what I've seen in um, Congress, is that they uh, want to understand the benefits of blockchain to uh, help their constituents, and they're just not getting that message across. Like, um, it is overshadowed uh, by everything that's happened in crypto in the past year. And it is very unfortunate because there are so many builders in Web3 that are working on all these different use cases. Even the panel before that had um, you know, the CFTC uh, talking about, uh, she, she wasn't even aware of all the work that was going on um, in all these different sectors, right? Um, and so I think more of that cross-pollination, more of the media covering all these different use cases really necessary to educate on why this is so important and, and you know, not just the crypto side. Yeah. Is it possible to separate crypto from web free? Anyone? <laughs> I think you said it, that web three is still a, a kind of cloudy concept. Yeah, it de depends on what you mean by separate. I think crypto is a key part of Web3, but crypto writ large, maybe, perhaps. Like to tokens are part of decentralized systems, typically. It's a way you distribute those economics. And that is crypto, and people are trading them. But the underlying token is being used on the chain for governance and to reward folks for participating. So I don't know. What do you mean by separate? Well, you know, I mean, um, Brad mentioned, you know, the crypto overshadowing Web3 and these discussions with regulators. And, and I'm wondering if they might be right, you know. I mean, they, they are, are they rightly concerned? I mean, there are things happening in crypto that are not great, so. Well, are, are they rightly concerned about some of the things going on in crypto, of course. Is it, can you distinguish right, right now the scale of the potential of Web3 from the current conversation? No, has that got to happen quickly? Yes, it's really got to happen because I think the, the potential is for just not fully understood at, at, at this stage. So who's gonna explain it? Anyone? Bloomberg. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we hope so. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, um, I'm really baffled sometimes when uh, these discussions, you know, it's, it's always the regulators who don't get it and need to be educated. So how is that going to happen? Or will they just, you know, suddenly see the light? Or what's the hope here, guys? 
I think it's going to happen over time. So I, I feel like my work in financial services is building a bridge over Death Valley to the promised land on the other side, the world where financial assets are issued digitally and they go down that new digital factory of finance and boy, it's like a robotics you know, machine line. The thing is, the way you do it is you show it. You, slat by slat, you build that bridge staring down asset class by asset class. You walk before you run in blockchain. You don't go zero to 180. And it is unproven in so many ways. It is so new in so many ways that regulators are absolutely right to be focused on the risks, and the, you know, which are many of them are actually unknown still, right? We have known uh, risks, but we have unknown risks. So I think, again, walking before you're running, making sure it's regulated participants, you can meet those regulatory obligations while still using blockchain technology as an example. So I think there's maturing, like even all these discussions, people know a lot more. It just will take time. It is so different. Like, DeFi is opposite of how TradFi works today. And somebody last time said, in TradFi, the law is the code. In DeFi, the code is the law. Those are like diametrically opposite uh, viewpoints. So it's gonna take time. And focusing on um, not just the risk, but the opportunities, I've seen some of the lobbying organizations set up demonstration booths where the regulators come in and they just try the technology and they're like, oh, I get it now, right? Like it's getting them to use it and then they see the benefits. Is it, is it over explained then? Because the idea, you know, that I can send value and original from A to B is not, you know, even I get that. So, you know, where, do, any, Fred, maybe any suggestions what the friction is? I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the least expert of, of all those on this, on this panel, clearly, given what I do. But I, I see a, a risk. The, the nature of the technology is hidden. It's not, in, it's not in your hand, it's not visible. The outcome, the benefit, the reward can be demonstrated. Um, but it's a bit like the power of a, a chip inside a device. You, you know it because the device works brilliantly and you get the results you want. But the technology is, is just not there. So somehow, I guess it's down to this community of people, this, this community of advocates to find a common voice in a really powerful way of conveying the power and the strength of the te technology that's hidden inside here. Um, it's, but I'm not sure that the window to do that is, 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 is wide open forever. I, because I think there are those whose business interests are, are different and, and they may well want to see the status quo continue for an awful lot longer. Um, let's do a little sort of look back and, and see if that's a projection forward, if um, I pa may paraphrase. Um, Lisa, you mentioned that you're an investor in uh, Web 2. Or Web 3. Uh, well, well, at yeah. one point, you know, originally in Web oh, well, 2. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what lessons would you draw from that experience? And, you know, that's relevant for today's discussion. And how did Web 1 turn into Web 2? What went wrong? I think it's called like the original sin or something that Mark Andreessen coined it, something like that. Anyway, it was like the fact that um, Web 2 had to rely on advertising instead of charging for um, what, what they were offering. And that led to the consumer being That's the what people go, yeah. yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah, so, so that is what is often talked about as, as what went wrong in Web 2. Um, I mean, I was investing during the dot-com implosion and uh, saw all these companies emerge out of those ashes, right? And I think the same thing is going to happen now, 20 years later. Um, and so that's why I'm so bullish about investing during these downturns because- I think people will pay this time? Um, well, I think what blockchain has enabled is just different business models, right? Just, just uh, a change and, and never before was possible for the end user to also have ownership. That's what's different about web three versus web two. Um, and sorry, I cut you off. You, you're saying no, there's no, a huge no, just, uh, opportunity. Yeah, I, I do think that uh, we clear out the fraudsters and, you know, there are plenty of people who do real diligence, who who do you know, who are real builders, who are um, going to emerge from this time period. We're going to look back and we're going to see it, 
uh, as clearly as we see Amazon and Google and all of this today. It's, it's going to happen now. And now's the time to be investing in this. Maybe that's why all those guys are trying to get to the moon, you know, saying, they say, you know, the time is up. Any more thoughts? Appreciate yeah, it. I think that what, what happened is that we let a handful of very powerful cor corporations build enclosures around our shared knowledge, our, share, our shared intellectual wealth. And by letting them build fences around what actually belongs to the public and that the whole public should enjoy, we uh, we created the system where members of the public are deprived of this immense um, source of uh, of knowledge that is necessary for us to evolve and, and build resilient societies. So it, I, I think you've all heard of the tragedy of the commons, right? And creative commons really fosters a, uh, a thriving commons. That what we see is that there's a tragedy of the anti-commons where so much of it just becomes enclosed and not accessible that we end up with the opposite tragedy, which is perhaps even worse. I, I just say not all Web2 business models are the same. There are those that have been more problematic than others, and there are those that have been more abusive than others. And I think, likewise, not all Web3 entrepreneurs, as we've seen in certain sectors, are um, righteous and able and, 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 and able in creating something of you know huge potential value. The, the, the challenges that Web2 created for us are now not corporate issues. They're global economic questions, societal issues, they're, they, they're fundamental to the disparity of wealth that we now see, all of these issues. So it's kind of morphed into another domain. Um, I think the challenge here is to demonstrate that Web3 offers solutions to some of those bigger issues. I hope so. I mean, in a previous panel I moderated about DeFi, I was told that it's not about wealth distribution. So, I don't know. I mean, it just sounds like it's going to go on and on and on, doesn't it? It's not about what distribution? Wealth distribution. Oh. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean if I say it's not... It's oh, um, I made the point that, you know, um, whether everyday people benefit from DeFi, and uh, one of um, the earlier panelists said that, well, it's this DeFi is not about wealth distribution. The point of DeFi is not to, you know, rearrange the way wealth is distributed today. I, I, I'm hearing the opposite. But, but, but it is about, I, from what I, the limited amount I know, this is about empowering the individual and giving control back to create uh, an ability to you know, engage with the world in a very different way. That can lead to a reset in terms of wealth distribution. And what I would say is, from my point of view, blockchain is about lowering the cost to serve. The cost of intermediated trust, which is how things work today. You ask your bank to make a payment. You ask your broker to sell your stock. That has worked, but it doesn't work when there's an alternative that will be much cheaper and more accessible. Because we have private funds issued on provenance, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith can have a thousand dollar exposure to private markets. Nobody can have an exposure to private markets today if you don't have a hundred grand or two hundred grand kind of thing. When you tokenize assets, you can reduce the threshold and therefore increase access. And as somebody who's worked around the world, there's a lot of people that don't have access. You have to have money to access financial services today. There's so many underbanked SMEs, so, you know, businesses, and consumers around the world. And that's because the existing financial infrastructure is very, very expensive. So yeah, I don't think it maybe dis redistributes wealth, but it, it increases access to grow the wealth that you have. It provides access. Yeah, and also uh, in that, you still need to be an accredited investor. There's only like 8 million of them, but um, I think for some of, and that's for tokenized assets or security tokens, um, you know, which are registered, but for some of DeFi, the narrative has been um, you know, access for people that are unbanked, um, that uh, maybe only have a mobile phone, they don't have a bank, you know, and, and they can do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And that increases access amongst the unaccredited investor base as well. So it's, I think it's both. Thank you. I'm going to give you a break, guys. Anyone fancy is giving the panel a question? I also believe that uh, the blockchain can solve problems. Uh, I just I cannot leave it back 
I, I need to say this. I have been working on decentralized social media for years, and for the years that I packed for the day for the Berlin Paris conference. Now, I'm just uh, happy to hear you speak. It was highlighted by Masari as one of their top five trends is decentralized social media th today. That it's in part of their publishing. So we have it now because I was working for them as a dog, and now have the first operating that's been sold. Thank you, Sandra. So I'm going to harken back to the concept that you guys talked about. What's kind of wrong about Web two? I read somewhere that eighty percent of scientific research is behind a paywall or a firewall of some sort. Imagine if I know that majority of that were actually unlocked for the world to actually go and innovate. The diseases, the, 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 the healthcare issues that we talked about today could actually, you could have an entire groundswell of innovation that goes on in about 10 years. I guess my question to you is, there are a couple areas that I see as low hanging fruit, scientific research being one of them. What will it take for us to actually unlock I think, Brigitte, you'll have to take this. Yeah, all you need is a CC license. So um, yeah, we work in this area. We've been doing that for 20 years. Colleagues of mine are invested in the fields of open education, open research, uh, and now open climate, because you mentioned the health crises. But climate is a huge area where open access to data can really unlock so much new research, so much new solutions. Even people don't even think about it, but museums, they hold so much information in their collections and they don't provide access to it. If they digitize their collection, put them available online, so many more people, citizens, you and me could have access to it and propose new solutions. It would not be just the privilege of the few that have access to those very expensive journals. There's one example of, um, I think it's the, um, um, the uh, Museum for Natural History of the, of the UK. They just recently digitized their whole collection of butterflies. And I thought, oh, this is a very quaint thing. And you, it's, it's really beautiful to look at all these butterflies. But they're actually able, uh, scientists were able to access this collection and see the evolution of butterflies over the last 200 years and show the impact of climate change on the morphology of butterflies. So we don't often think about this, but cultural institutions also hold a lot of knowledge that is essential if we want to solve today's biggest challenges. And opening up their collections is crucial to this mission. I'm really glad you brought this up, Sandra, because in New York, there's a DSI movement happening for this exact use case. And I think you also mentioned healthcare. There's drug Dow. There's there's all these things, and and you know it is about money because the drug companies want to preserve what they have. But drug Dow has proven that um, they can get drugs to market faster to help more people. That's just one healthcare use case, right? There's others, and they're coming. Um, so I, I'm really excited about all these other areas that are going to be unlocked that are really underreported, and and we'll have you know, really huge benefits for society. I think we're almost out of um, time. So just one um, final question to all of you, please. And we'll draw a line there. Cocktail time. Um, how long will this take, this transition? Lisa, can we start with you? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> if I knew. I think well, that's the correct answer. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I try and think five years out all the time. I feel like that's my job. Um, so I'm hoping that it happens faster, but we do need to get through a lot of regulation and that's going to probably take this year and next year. And, and, and then I think we'll start seeing an acceleration in some of this, but, uh, less than yeah. 10 years, more than 10 years, less, I'm going to say less. Thank you. Yeah. Brad. Well, the basis of gut feeling alone, um, less than 10 years. I mean, the one thing I would say, having just like, we all live through this COVID moment. When you, when you read, reset the incentives for, for research, what can be achieved in the period that it can be achieved is phenomenal. And so if, if the framework's reset, I think it's got to be less than 10 years. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I really cannot see into the future, but at Creative Commons, we're really invested in um, a movement for a better internet. Uh, we have a coalition of several public interest uh, nonprofit in organizations that 
get together to really try to shape what the future iteration of the web will be. And common principles and, and values include um, privacy, openness, sustainability, um, inclusivity, and this is what we want to see. I don't know how, how long it's going to take, but uh, if Creative Commons is part of it, we want to see those values uh, manifested. Thank you. Um, if I focus on financial services, it's a big world out there, maybe 20% of the world's GDP and a lot of asset classes. I believe that, you know, again, this year, lots of different asset classes deepening in private space where it's high friction, high opacity, expensive. Um, but to get across all of the world's asset classes globally, that's at least a decade in my view. Well, thank you so much for helping me navigate the checkout and not making me do all of the scanning alone. So please give a good big hand to the panel. Thank you.